The first three chapters you have doctrine, and it's what we believe. Here's the doctrine, here's the belief, here's the calling of the believer and the body of Christ. Here's why God formed the body of Christ. Beginning in chapter 4, verse 1, he says, Therefore, because of who you are in Christ, because of what God's done to you, here's your conduct, here's your, here's your, there's your wealth, here's your walk. The prisoner of the Lord, I, I, the prisoner, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you're called. There is a lifestyle that the members of the body of Christ are to, to produce. We're by grace you are saved, chapter 2, uh, verse 8, through faith that not of yourself is the gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God before ordained that we should walk in them. In other words, God formed the church, the body of Christ, and when he formed the church, the, when he planned the church, the body of Christ, he had some works designed for the body of Christ to accomplish. And that, those works and the, the purpose and the function of the body of Christ that we're all made a part of when we trust Christ is what the first three chapters of Ephesians is all about, the doctrine of, of it, our calling. Now he's going to talk, now, he, now that you have that calling, now that you have that identity, here's what it's going to look like and what he's going to focus on in the last three chapters is the conduct that the body of Christ is to exemplify. And it's not just in our individual life. The book of Romans lays, lays a grace orientation foundation for you and for me and how that you and I as, member, as, as saints of the Most High God have been equipped in Christ Jesus to live on planet earth for God's glory, to be the vehicle in whom the life of Christ lives and who, 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 how he lives his life out through us. When you come to Ephesians, the emphasis isn't just on the individual so much as it is the corporate identity and work of ministry that we have together. So he starts in verse 2 describing the unity uh, with all lo our walks with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There's this unity that God has made with us as members of the body of Christ, reconcile us to God in one body by the cross. And that unity, that, that, that identity and that oneness that he's made in the Spirit is designed to, to demonstrate itself out through us. You know, I just, this is kind of an aside, but I'm thinking about it. When you come to the book of Ephesians, over and over the issue of the Trinity, the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is mentioned. I've talked with you about that over and over again. We had a, I studied with you a couple of weeks ago about the life of the Godhead, how God, when he said it's going to be glorified, the glory of God is a demonstration of his life, the God-likeness, living like God lives. And when you think about the Godhead, the creator, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, the Godhead is the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. And the life that the Godhead lives, as they live one for the other, the most fundamental thing about life and the Godhead, being Godlike in life, is the issue of relationships. God the Father lives in relationship with the Son and the Spirit. The Son lives in a relationship with the, with, with, with the Father and the Spirit, and so on and so forth. That's why when he said he created Adam, and he said it's not good that Adam would be alone. He needed a peer to have a relationship with, because that's how you live the life that God gave you. That's why loneliness... Isolation. What does sin do? It builds walls. It separates. It alienates you from the life of God. If you look down at verse 17 there, uh, when he says, I therefore, I say therefore, and testify on the Lord, that you henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being aliened, uh, alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that's in them. And when he's talking about being alienated from the life of God, he's not just talking about being lost. He's talking about being separated from the way God lives. You see, the big problem with sin is that the wages of sin is death. The problem with lost people is that they're dead. <laughs> they're separated from God's life. And he's telling you as a believer, don't live like you're separated from God's life because you're not. And that being alienated from the life of God, where God's, the way God lives doesn't function in you. And so when you come here, he's going to talk to us in, 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 in these chapters about having relationships with other members of the body and the unity that God's made with us in Christ is to be what we live in our life. Now that unity begins, as if, you're, if you're saved, it begins in your marriage. If you're married. Now you've got to be married to have, you know, have that relationship. But that relationship, Solomon says, my, talk about it, he says, my sister, my spouse, 
the greatest privilege you have as a, as a married person is to be married to another member of the body of Christ and have a saint of the Most High God as your spouse. And that relationship, then you have families, a relationship. You pass on values, culture, you have relationships, and that life living out through all those relationships. There's to be that oneness. Then in verse 7 he says, But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. There's always a but. The shoe's going to fall out of the closet now. There's always a, yeah, but what about this? That unity that God has made, that we're to live in, lives in the midst of our diversity. And, you know, to me, that's a wonderful thing. You look around a group like this and you see all kind of different people, all kind of different shades of people, economic shades, theological shades, thinking shades, education shades, uh, skin shades, all, every, all different kind of people, diversity. And yet the unity is brought in. That's when you have real unity is when you have diversity and then you're able to lay all of that aside and have a unity around who you are in Christ. But the unity is to be lived in the midst of diversity. You don't ignore the diversity. You just say, hey, out of all of this, look what God's doing. But every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore, he said, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. So God, in the, not only is there a physical diversity and an and intellectual diversity, but God himself made some differences in the members of the body of Christ as far as gifts were concerned. Now that issue of the gifts, he's going to deal with that first. Verse number, if you skip the parenthesis of verse 9 and 10 and, and, and go to verse number 11, and he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Why did he do that? For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. If the body of Christ is going to be built up, it'll be built up because the work of the ministry is done. And if the work of the ministry is going to be done, it's because some saints have been perfected and mature to get that done. And if that's going to be accomplished, it's because he gave some gifts to bring about the maturity. If you want to see what the maturity looks like, you read verse 13, 14, 15, 16. That's what the maturity, the perfecting, that's what it looks like. Verse uh, 14, he says, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men, and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love, may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body, fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplies. you got the whole body put together in, a, in, in one compacted unit, according to the effectual working of the in the measure of every part, Maketh increase of the body and the edifying of itself. That's a great description of what a local church, a life in a local church, produces, the relationship issues. Now, I want to go back with you to verse 11 this morning because those gifts that are back here are important in relationship to that issue of growing in the maturity. And you need to understand about the gifts because if there's anything that causes confusion in the minds of people today, is the issue of spiritual gifts. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul says, I, Brethren, I would not have you to be ignorant concerning spiritual gifts. And the ignorance that was at Corinth about spiritual gifts demonstrates that we live in a very Corinthian-type church age. You know, when Paul wrote Romans, doctrine, then there's reproof and correction, the Corinthians and the Galatians, and if you look around you out here in the world today, if you, if you, see, if you look at believers who are not established in, in, in the doctrine of Romans about grace orientation, you're, the result of that's going to be you're going to be a Galatian or a Corinthian. The Galatians were Moses-focused, law keepers. The Corinthians were man-focused. In our modern terminology, we'd be talking about Calvinist, Calvinism, Galatians, or the Charismatics, the Corinthians, where you're focused on, and the Corinthians were focused on, 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 on a misunderstanding of what the gift program was all about, used it to puff themselves up and edify themselves rather than the purpose of the gifts. So it's important to understand something about what the gift thing is. If you go to the average Christian bookstore today, and 
I mean, there aren't, any, there aren't very many of them left anymore. Have you noticed that? If you go to the average Christian bookstore of yesterday, uh, you, you find the, the predominant book is How To. How to Be Happy Though Married. That's my absolute favorite title. <laughs> like that's a shock. <laughs> you know, How to Win Over Depression. How to, how to, how to Be Happy and blah, blah, blah. It's the How To books. And all of that, you focus on the practical side of Christianity and the practical side of the Christian life is part of Paul's epistles, but it's all based upon the doctrinal issue. You can't behave if you don't have the right believing. You, you can't, your conduct didn't, has to be based on your calling and an understanding of the doctrine so that it then lives out through your life. And all those how-to things, and most of them, if not all of them, have been overtaken with the idea that everybody has a gift. And that those gifts are, you know, when you got saved, God gave you a special gift. And without you, you need to find that gift. You need to seek that gift. You need... If it's a gift, folks, you can't seek it. You notice that? I mean, that, that if it's a gift, you don't, you don't try to get. Do you say, you know, <laughs> my wife asked the grandkids, what would you like for your birthday? You do that? You ask a three-year-old, what do you want for your birthday? What does he know about what he wants for his birthday? <laughs> but if you ask him, you know, he tells you. He tells her, Halloween's coming. What do you want? What, what, what kind of costume? Well, at school, they're going to have a Halloween costume. He says, I want a gecko costume, whatever, the, you know, whatever that is. <laughs> He's been, he watches Paw Patrol. They run commercials. And so now he wants a gecko costume. <laughs> so he tells his grandma, he says, uh, I want a gecko costume. So a day or two ago, he asked her, he says, have you ordered my costume yet? <laughs> and she says, well, it's not, it's not time yet. He says, well, let me know when it arrives. <laughs> now, see, that doesn't compute to me. But that's not the way you do a gift. That's a request. That's not a gift. That's a has it come yet kind of thing. That's backwards. Spiritual gifts are, are real things in the Bible, but you need to understand in this passage, the issue about the gifts, help, this, this is a great passage to help you understand what's going on with the gift program, and I, I don't want you to miss this. Verse, verse number 8, first thing to notice, we've already looked at this at some, some, some uh, detail, I'm just going to review it, but I want you to, I, I don't want to go over these verses and, and, and not make sure that you understand, don't abuse these things, don't misuse these things, and don't be confused by these things. And I know a lot of you understand this, but I know some of you don't. If hundreds of people watching on the Internet, there's always people there that don't get it. And it's important in a passage like this that you understand what's happening here. And this passage will help you figure that out. Verse number 8, Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. What did he give them? Verse 11, some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Notice that these gifts in verse 12, verse 11, were given, verse 8, after he ascended up on high. Now why is that important? Well, you know that the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, he comes back here in the books of Matthew to John, the Lord Jesus Christ in his er earthly ministry back here, Matthew to John, Jesus Christ ministered back here. He chose 12 apostles. Okay? Then he dies on the cross. He ascends into heaven, sends the Holy Spirit back on those 12 apostles, and they minister here at the, as the book of Acts begins. These 12 apostles are the apostles he gave while he was on the earth. Then the, you have the fall of Israel. The Lord Jesus Christ from heaven saves Saul of Tarsus, makes him Paul the Apostle, and you have the church, the body of Christ, where we are today. This thing back here in your Bible is called prophecy. Peter says, John the Baptist's daddy says back here in Luke 1, Peter says in Acts chapter 3 that the things that he's talking about, Acts 3.21, is that which is spoken by the mouth of all the holy prophets since the world began. So this, this ministry goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, and what God has been revealing since the world began has to do, and that's called prophecy in the Bible. When you come to Paul, you come to a thing that he calls the mystery, something that was kept secret since the world began. 
Now, if you don't get that, let me explain it to you. If something has been made known, preached about, talked about since the world began, and something has not been made known, not been talked about, not preached about since the world began, they are not the same. Okay? Now, that's not brain surgery. But to miss that, you're going to be worse and confu- you're going to be more confused than a termite in a yo-yo. <laughs> that's a simple division in God's Word on the timing of the revelation. What he's doing back here, and the reason for that is the ministry back here focuses on the nation Israel and God's plan and purpose in the earth. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and he makes a man out of the earth. And the issue back here is this seed of the woman producing a redeemer who's going to redeem the earth, bring a kingdom over here, to establish the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ on the earth. Why do you think he said the meek shall inherit the earth? It sure doesn't happen today, but it will happen one day when he comes back over here and sets up his kingdom. I was listening on the radio coming in this morning. Uh, I had to come in earlier than normal because I had a, a counseling session uh, with some people getting married. They're, if you're going to get married, you really need counseling. And so I, you know, I got, I was, I was, and I was listening to the guy on the radio in front of us our program, and they were talking about, you know, come and, and help us with kingdom life and kingdom ministry. Do you understand why the world can fear people that are always talking about God building a kingdom? That is a political term. That is a governmental term. Christianity, from the time of the, of the fifth century until now, has been dominated by a, a Christian religious organization, Christendom, called Roman Catholicism, which is part of what Roman Catholicism tells you is that they run the politics of the world. You go all through the Dark Ages to the Protestant Reformation in the 1500s, and, and the Pope literally would have the, the, the kings and the, and the rulers and the noblemen of, of, of a country could be come and bow in front of him. And he has two keys on his sash, one to the kingdom of heaven, one to the kingdom of God, one to rule the politics in the earth, one to let you in heaven or not. And those two things, and listen, it's no wonder that people fear. When our country was founded, one of the things that they were running from, and the reason you have a First Amendment, is so that they weren't going to have a religious institution called Romanism come and run the political structure of the country. They didn't want that. They'd had that. They were escaping from it, put a pond between them and put up a law, a wall and says, leave that over there, don't bring it here. Okay, now that's politics, and I'm not supposed to talk about politics, but that's not politics. Listen, to say we are premillennial Bible-believing Christians, that the, the kingdom that Jesus Christ is going to establish will not be established on this earth until, the, until he comes back after the tribulation period, the body of Christ goes out before that. He goes back, finishes that. Here's the Antichrist, all those things. The wrath of God's poured out. And then Jesus Christ sets up a kingdom. The government of this earth, the ecology of this earth, the economy of this earth, the health program of this earth is not going to be fixed until Jesus comes back. And when he comes back, he will fix it all. He's got a wonderful health care program. He's got a wonderful economic program. He's got a wonderful ecology program. His sustainability program will work. And when, you, when we talk about that, we say, listen, we have to do the best we can with a, with a fallen creation until then. And in that day, the time of restitution of all things, he will remove the curse and put it back the way God intended it to be. And when you go around talking about building a kingdom today, you're communicating not just ignorance, you're communicating some, some error to the world out there about what God's doing today. God's not trying to build a kingdom today. He's not reclaiming real estate. He's not reclaiming governmental structures today. He's saving some people out of the wreck that this world is headed for. And it was just at the point over here when Stephen sees him standing, ready to come and pour that wrath out, that God interrupted that prophetic program and put a dispensation of grace in here where he's going to do something that before the foundation of the world, he's planned to do, but just didn't reveal it till it got here. 
And the reason he didn't reveal it, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul says, We speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God before the world ordained to our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they wouldn't have crucified the Lord of glory. Because he kept that secret, Satan, who said there wasn't any secret you could keep from him. The issue between God and Satan has never been power. It's always been an issue of wisdom. Who has the right to exercise the power? How many times have I said, if you could step out on nothing and create a universe, you're the big dog on the block. You are God Almighty. But anybody sitting here knows that you could be the big dog on the block and be a bully. Doesn't mean you have the, 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 the character and the wisdom necessary to exercise the power for the benefit of others. And the contest between God and Satan was well, Satan said, I got a better plan than God does for this creation. And his attempt was to be like the Most High God so that he could be the possessor of heaven and earth. And God says, I've got some wisdom. I'll show you how smart I am and how dumb he is. I'll take the wise in his own craftiness. I'll let him do his best, do, it, do, his, do, do, do his deal all the way, and I'll just keep one little realm of information secret, and he'll do the thing that destroys him. And Satan never understood the wisdom of God's love and grace. He never understood the life of God where you esteem other better than yourself. Pride doesn't do that. Sin doesn't do that. The middle letter of the word sin, the middle letter of the word pride, never look out for the other, it's look out for me. Get all you can, can all you can get. And what it happened is that God had, a, had another plan, a plan called grace, but he also had another purpose. There's a whole government in the heavens up here. And he had an agency that he planned to create the body of Christ to populate that government in the heavens. And that's what he's forming today, a spiritual body of believers made out of Jew, Gentile, bond, or free, male, or free, no matter who you are. In the wisdom of God, when the world by wisdom knew not God, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching the cross to save them that believe. People say, I had a letter from a lady just this past week off the television program. Can you please explain to me about election predestination? Confused about it. And her problem was she'd been going on the Internet looking at a bunch of websites that are more confused than she was. They were more confused before she asked the question than she was after she asked it. You want a verse that will help you with that? 1 Corinthians 121. In the wisdom of God, here's the wisdom of God. When the world by its wisdom didn't know God, it pleased God. Here's the sovereign free will of Almighty God. Before the foundation of the world, God planned to form the body of Christ. You know what he said? It pleased him in his sovereign free will to save them that believe, that trust his son and his son alone. And when you believe in Jesus, you become a part of that group that God has chosen. That's what the word elect means, to make up that body with. And when you put you in that body of Christ, he said, I've predestinated that body of Christ to a purpose. Those two programs are the basic fundament. That's what God's doing today. Is he's not building a kingdom. He's not reclaiming real estate. He's not trying to make you a part of Israel. You're not one of the 12 tribes. You're not, you're not one of the 144,000. You're not Israel. You're not replacement Israel. You're not all this stuff. You're something entirely unique in the program of God. You're the church, the body of Christ. It's a spiritual body of believers. That's why you're blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. That's why it says, by one spirit are we all baptized into one body and all been made to drink into that one spirit. You've been taken by God and placed into living union with his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, you, I, I get thinking, I'll go back to chapter one and start preaching about that. You know, you're, you're accepted in him. All The wonderful status, the wonderful identity you get in this new position in Christ Jesus. After 
Christ ascended into the heavens. Verse 8. After he's ascended, he gave some more apostles. My point to you is the apostles and prophets that he's talking about, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, are not Israel's program. They're a new, different, distinct program. And if you can read third grade English, you can get that. And you don't need to know anything about Greek. You don't need to have a preacher that does. You just read English right there in the King James Bible and you got it. Verse number 8. Wherefore he said, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive. Now we spent all summer talking about that. He's won a victory over the Lord over Satan, made an open show of them openly, took the captivity, took captive those that held you captive, and gave gifts unto men. After his ascension, he gave the gifts. Then it's not the apostles and prophets aren't these, they're new ones. Now, if you can get that, then you got a chance of getting verse, verse, 12, verse 11. Notice in verse 11. And he gave. You notice it doesn't say he's giving. He gave. That's past tense. That's really hard to get sometime, isn't it? Verse 13. He gave till we all come into the unity of the Spirit. There is a time stamp placed on the giving of the gifts. They have an expiration date on them. You see that? My wife, you go to the grocery store, she buys something. First thing she looks at is the expiration date. If it's in our refrigerator and the expiration date is tomorrow, yesterday she threw it away. That expiration date's important to her. Years ago I worked in a, back when I was, before I was married and was going to school, I worked in a hospital. I was an orderly. You remember orderlies back in the 60s? You guys don't know what they are today. They were glorified bedpan slingers. And one of my jobs at the Escambi County Hospital in Pensacola, Florida, was if someone, I was on the fourth floor, and if someone died, I worked 11 7 shift, if someone died, one of my jobs was to take their body down to the morgue, county morgue. And so usually, at least once a night, I had the privilege of going and helping someone load a body onto a gurney. and we would On that body, now you can't say, hey, John, who are you? You know, so on that body, they had a toe tag. And on that toe tag, it had two things. One, the room number, and two, the expiration date. Now, the gift program has got a toe tag. It isn't going to last forever. It's going to last until. So it's important for you to see, number one, that the, the gifts he's talking about are not Israel's program. They're, they're gifts in the program of the body of Christ. So the gifts that are there aren't going to be preaching that, that message. They're going to be preaching and teaching about what Paul writes in Romans through Philemon. Okay? Also, it's important for you to understand that these gifts that are here, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, have a, 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 an expiration date on them. They aren't going to last forever. Now, if you want the expiration date, hold your hand here and come to 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and compare verse 13 with 1 Corinthians 13. 1 Corinthians 13, verse number 8. Because when he talks to them about the spiritual gifts in 1 Corinthians 13, 12, 13, and 14, he also puts an expiration date on them there. 1 Corinthians 13, verse number 8. 1 Corinthians 13, 8. Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. Now when he says prophecy, tongues, and knowledge, he's not talking about talking, knowing, and, and, and speaking. He's talking about the gift of prophecy, the gift of tongues, and the gift of knowledge, which is what he's talking about all through the chapter. There's never going to be a time when you don't know Eternal life is to know God. If, if knowing, knowledge, thinking passed away, eternal life has to pass away. There's never going to be a time when people don't talk. So he's talking about the gifts of tongues, the gift of prophecy, the gift of knowledge. And he says these gifts are going to they're, they're, they're fail. 
they're going to cease, they're going to vanish away. Well, when? Why? For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, if you only have partial knowledge, your preaching is always going to be partial. But, here comes the but, when that which is perfect is come, that which is in part shall be done away. So the question is, what is the perfect? Well, here's so that's Jesus. That's heaven. We sing the song, face to face I shall behold him far beyond. You know, and that comes out of verse 12. Don't get your theology out of the hymn book. That hymn's wrong. It's not what this is talking about. The hymn's not wrong. It's just not what this verse is talking about. When he says, that which is perfect has come, that which is in part should be done. What's, going to be, what's in part? Well, look at verse 9. What's in part? So you know the answer already. Knowledge. Well, if, if knowledge is what's going to be done away with, what does away with partial knowledge? Full knowledge. Anybody knows that. So when that which is perfect, when the complete revelation comes, what's going to happen with the partial revelation? It does away with it. Why? Because now I got it all. I don't have part. I got the whole thing. Well, when does the complete revelation come? Well, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 13. Till we all come into the unity of the faith. We're not going to do what Romans 12 says, have a partial faith. We're going to have the unity. You're going to have the whole faith and the knowledge of the Son of God under a perfect man, under the measure, the stature, the fullness of Christ. Now, people say, well, that's heaven. Listen, God has never given you any indication in, your, in, in the Bible that he's satisfied for you to wait till you get to heaven to become a mature saint. When verse 13 happens, verse 14 happens. You're no longer tossed to and fro and carried about by everyone to doctrine. If verse 13 is the coming of Jesus and his heaven, then you're going to be tossed to and fro and carried about by everyone to doctrine till, till, till you get to heaven. No, I'm sorry. In, in a system that you teach it might work that way, in the Bible it doesn't. You're to be established in the faith as you've been taught, abounding there with thanksgiving. You're not to be tossed to, and you don't have to be tossed to and fro because you've been given a perfect understanding. You've been given the measure of the, of the statue of the fullness of Christ. You've been given the unity of the faith and knowledge of the Son of God. Where's that? You got it in your hand, folks. It's that book. How today do you perfect the saints? 2 Timothy 3.16 the scripture is given that the man of God may be perfect. Well, gee, if I wanted to be perfect, where would I go today? I don't go to somebody who's going to have some gift and tell me I need to get in his religious system. God gave every one of you, and he gave me a book that has the capacity of bringing us to maturity and perfection. You can be just as perfected as I am, and I can be just as perfected as you are, because we equally hold God's revelation, the knowledge of the Son of God. We, we, we have it all, the fullness of the statue of Christ, right there in that book. The perfected saints do the work of the ministry. Well, what's 2 Timothy 3 say? That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto every good work. How? By the book. To the edifying of the body of Christ. That's exactly what doctrine, proof, correction, instruction, that's what it's about. Now that the full revelation has been given, the Word of God does today what the gifts once did. You don't, God doesn't need to give supernatural enablements today to some people. One person's got one gift, one another. Because we all equally have the Word of God, which gives all of us the information together. So the jobs that He gave these supernatural gifts to, to accomplish, now the Word of God does. Now, if you get that, the gift program won't confuse you. Now, what about the things in verse 11? What about the apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors? All of these are communication gifts. All of these are gifts involved in communicating doctrine, truth. Those gifts, those, the jobs that those gifts did still need to be done. Why? Because verse 12, the perfecting of the saints still needs to be accomplished. 
You see that? You, just, you still need to understand that the work that those gifts were accomplishing now is accomplished by God's Word, but the job still needs to be done because they were given for the perfecting of the saints who are for the work of the ministry. For the other. So if you want the saints to be perfected so the work of the ministry, you still need these jobs. They're just not supernaturally imparted. That's the hump to get over. Well, if the jobs still need to, be done, need to be done, what are the jobs? Now, that's my point this morning. You don't need a gift. What you need is, 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 is you don't have gifts today. You have jobs today. <laughs> you got some work. Apostles, notice how he says it. Apostles, he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. Now, if you go back to chapter 2, you'll notice that the apostles and prophets are grouped together in Ephesians. Chapter 2, verse number 19. Now therefore we are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Notice, apostles and prophets have to do with laying a foundation. Chapter 3, verse number 2. If you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote a four and few words, whereby when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it is now revealed by his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Notice, Paul says, The Lord Jesus Christ revealed to me the mystery. That mystery is now revealed by his holy apostles and prophets, by the Spirit. Notice the contrast. Christ revealed it to Paul. The Holy Spirit is now revealing it through the apostles and prophets. You see that? That's important to see. Somebody read verse 5 and they say, well, when he says, which in other ages are not made known as it is now revealed, they say, well, it was revealed back there, but just not as fully as here. And that's not true. If I say to you, they didn't have general electric refrigerators in Abraham Lincoln's day as they have now. Am I telling you they had some back there that just have as good ones now? No, see, you understand what that means. And the way you know that, that's, that it's an absolute is because you can read Romans 16, 25, you can read Colossians 1, 25, and you can read verses that tell you, no, it was hidden. But it is now revealed, not just by Christ to Paul, but through Paul's ministry... The Spirit of God reveals it to the apostles and prophets. What I want you to see is the apostles and prophets are linked together, and they are linked with the issue of revealing and laying a foundation of doctrine and information. Now, by the way, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, just so you get the foundation right. 1 Corinthians 3, verse number 10. According to the grace of God which is given unto me, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereupon. Let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon, for other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone of everything God's ever going to do. But there's the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, but now is revealed that isn't found in the Scripture prior to Paul. And Paul lays that foundation of grace truth in here. And involved in Paul's laying it are other apostles. You notice that verse in Ephesians says plural. He had other associates working with him. Now, you're in 1 Corinthians, look over at chapter 14, and notice the prophets. 1 Corinthians 14, verse number 37. Did you ever want to know how you could tell if someone is, what is, spirit, is, is spiritual today? Everybody says, what does it mean to be spiritual? You know, as soon as you hear somebody talking about that, you know, you, 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 the hair on the back of your neck goes up, and you think, mm, are they, you know, they want to sell me a book now, I know. They got to... They gotta, Set of DVDs are trying to pedal. First <laughs> Corinthians 15, 14, verse 37. 
If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. One of the ministries of the prophets had to do with being able to identify the written word of God. So the apostles and prophets are linked together because they focus on laying the foundation and originating what Paul calls the word of his grace. <clears throat> here's the revelation, here's the doctrine, here's the scripture, here they are. Then when he talks about evangelists, pastors, and teachers, they get linked together. But when you talk about an apostle, uh, go, go back with me to Romans chapter 1 just a second. That word apostle is really spelled out in English. Uh, 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 you know, sometimes you have words that are transliterated over in, into a language. Romans chapter 1, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated into the gospel of God. Notice the word apostle means a, one, one who's been sent. They sent one. Who sent him? Who called him to be an apostle? He didn't volunteer. God gave him the job. See that? An apostle is somebody that God sends. Now, come over to chapter 11, Romans 11, verse number 13. For I speak unto you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles. I magnify mine office. The Apostle Paul is a very special apostle in the Bible. Those 12 apostles back here were the apostles of the nation Israel. Now, us Gentiles have an apostle. And Paul said, I speak to you Gentiles because I am the apostle to the Gentiles. I'm the head dude sent to you. If you've heard, I, for this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, Ephesians 3.1, for you Gentiles, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God that's given to me, to send to you, you word, you Gentiles. Paul's God's messenger. He initiates this program to Israel. But look at chapter 16. Romans chapter 16. Verse 3. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ Jesus, who have for my life laid down their own necks, unto whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Well, listen, that's a scandalous thing prior to Paul. The idea of having churches among the Gentiles, that's part of this program. But who is it that helps establish those? Priscilla and Aquila. My point to you is that Paul had people that labored with him in the ministry, who go with him in ministry, and they function as people that are sent to do the work. Look with me, for example, at Acts chapter 14, verse 14. Which, when the apostles, notice it's plural, who are they? Barnabas and, and Paul. Notice that Barnabas was one, was also an apostle. Paul is the apostle, but he had other apostles working with him. Why? Because God gave apostles. He didn't just send Paul out by himself. He sent Paul out as the initial revel the one who initially gets the revelation from Christ, but then he associates with Paul some apostles and prophets who the Spirit of God uses to teach and to re reveal and communicate the information. Come with me to 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians, chapter number 1. Come over to chapter 2, verse 6 first. 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 6. Nor of men sought we glory, neither of you, nor yet of others, when we might have been burdensome as the apostles, plural, of Christ. Well, who's he talking about coming to Thessalonica and preaching there? We'll look back at verse 1. Paul, Silvanius, and Timotheus. Silvanius is the, Greek, the, the Gentile name for Silas. So Paul, Timothy, and Silas, Paul identifies as I'm the apostle, and these are apostles that work with me. Okay? So apostles in the Bible have to do with people who are sent to accomplish a job of laying foundation. Now the prophets, 
a prophet in the Bible, come back, come back to the book of Exodus, uh, chapter 7. It's important that you know, some, sometimes people get all kind of work. By the way, apostles in the Bible, T.D. Jakes is not an apostle. I heard a guy last night on the radio, on the TV, talking about this revelation God just gave through the apostle T.D. Jakes. Hey, and T.D. Jakes is a nice guy and all that business. You probably, I don't know, don't know him. But uh, he teaches some real quirky doctrine. Best thing you do is stay away from his, teach, his Bible teaching. Uh, I mean, he'll help you lose some weight and that kind of stuff. He's done that, but, but stay away from the Bible stuff. And, uh, he said he, and he, he's an apostle. I told you about the first time anybody ever did that to me. I was, I was down doing a street, in a street meeting in, on Bourbon Street in New Orleans back in the late 60s. And uh, he was talking to a kid and asking about whether he's saved. He, and he had testimony. He said, well, do you know who your apostle is? And he said, yeah, and he named some preacher locally. You know, I'm thinking Bible. He's talking about, you know, contemporary. Because people use those titles. It's, it's bogus, but people do that, okay? Well, prophet is the same thing. Somebody says, well, I got a word from God. I'm a prophet. What is a prophet in the Bible? Um, Exodus chapter 7, verse 1. And the Lord said unto Moses, See, I have made thee a god to Pharaoh, standing in God's place. And Aaron thy brother shall be thy prophet. Well, what was Aaron's job? Well, look back at chapter 4, because God gave Aaron a job. Exodus chapter 4. God told Moses, go and t talk to Pharaoh. Moses says, I, can't, I, I don't, I don't, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not a public speaker. Can't do that. I'm slow as tongue. So verse 15, thou, God says to Moses, Thou shalt speak to him, talking about Aaron. Read verse 14. The anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, Is not Aaron the Levite thy brother? I know that he can speak well. Also, behold, he, he, uh, behold, he cometh forth to meet thee, and when he seeth thee, he will be glad in his heart. And thou shalt speak unto him, and put words in his mouth. And I will be with, his mouth, with thy mouth, and with his mouth, and will teach you what ye shall do, and he shall be thy spokesman unto the people. And he shall be even he shall be uh, to thee instead of a mouth, and thou shalt be to him to him instead of God. Now there's a lot of stuff in that verse helps you about inspiration that kind of stuff, but God said I'm going to put the words in your mouth. Then you're going to put the words in Aaron's mouth, and Aaron's going to be your spokesman. He's going to be your prophet. So what's a prophet? He's somebody that speaks for somebody else. A prophet in the Bible is one to, through whom God speaks. Now the gift of prophecy in the Bible had to do with the communication of doctrine for the purpose of edifying people. Come with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. 1 Corinthians 14. 1 Corinthians 14, verse number 3. He that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification, exhortation, and comfort. He's going to speak God's word to build people up and edify them, exhort them, comfort them. If you go down to verse 26. Make it verse 29. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 29. Let the prophets speak two or three, and let the other judge. If anything be revealed to another that sitteth by, let the first hold his peace. For ye may all prophesy one by one, and not all, that all may learn, and all may be comforted. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets, for God is not the author of confusion, but of peace as in all the churches of the saints. Now that's real clear. Let the prophets just speak one at a time so everybody can get what's being said. Because the purpose of the prophet is for edification. So there's this special track that they're on to bring about edification. That's why verse 37, if any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. Because that's where edification 
is going to be found. Now, go back to Ephesians 4. There's one big difference between the apostles and prophets that you don't want to miss. There are other differences, but one, one big thing is apostles, both are, both are communication gifts. An apostle has authority wherever he goes. A prophet has authority in the local church where he ministers. So one is going to have authority everywhere. Paul did, Timothy did, Titus did. So a prophet is right there in your midst. So you have the, the, the issue of right there. So the, 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 the thing has to do... By the way, where would the ministry of apostles and prophets be found today? If they had to do with laying the foundation of the truth and, and identifying what God's Word is. Their ministry today is still needed. God just doesn't give special gifts of, of apostles and prophets. Their ministry is needed, and it's found right there in that book that you've got. Because when he says the prophets identify the things that I write as the Word of God. You remember that verse in Romans 16, 26, where he talks about the scriptures of the prophets? You know the prophets never wrote scripture. People say, well, that's Paul's writings. No, Paul never wrote as a, uh, as a prophet. He was a prophet, Acts 13, 1, but he never wrote it. He always wrote as an apostle. But what the prophets did is they would identify, here's an epistle from Paul that's scripture. You read 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 9. He says, in a former epistle I wrote to you, you don't have it in the Bible. Why not? People say, whoo, lost books of the Bible. No. God had a mechanism where when Paul wrote a book that God wrote that was Scripture, there was somebody in that local church that could say, that's Scripture. When a copy of, of that book went to another assembly, they had someone there who could say, that's Scripture. And those prophets literally identified the Word of God, put it together, collated it together, made copies, and sent it out among all the epistles. In 2, Corinthians, 2 Peter chapter 3, the churches, the circumcision believers, had copies of Paul's epistles, he said. You think they had the originals? Would you have given up an original? Well, you'd have never got it if it got here. I wouldn't let you have it. I wouldn't even let you have it. Much less send it off to somebody I didn't know. No, they made copies. And who does that? There's a supernatural gifted group of people in the assembly there to make the copies, the prophets, until the Word of God is collated and put together. Don't you believe this religious baloney that it was a 3rd, 4th, and 5th century before your Bible was completed? Before the time of the, uh, uh, before the end of the 1st century, way before the end of the 1st century, your Bible was, was, was written, put together, collated, identified, and distributed. Now, I know that's not what church history tells you, but that's what the Bible indicates. And one of the ministries of the prophets was to produce that. Now, you don't have that supernatural production today, but you still need the preservation of God's Word, don't you? And that's something that the, is the job of the church, which is the pillar and the ground of truth. Now, go back to Ephesians because we've run out of time. Chapter 4, verse number 11. He gave some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Now these three gifts focus on not laying the foundation, but the proclamation. They don't focus so much on forming the Scripture and the doctrine as on preaching the doctrine. Come with me to Acts chapter 21. The only person in the, in the Bible who is identified as an evangelist, you notice in, in, in Ephesians, it's plural. Acts chapter 21, Stephen, you remember who Stephen was? Stephen is identified, Acts 21, verse number 8. I'm, I said Stephen, I, mean, I meant Philip, I'm sorry. Acts 21, verse 8. And the next day, were, we that were of Paul's company departed and came into Caesarea. That's on the coast of, of Israel. And, and entered into the house of Philip the evangelist which was one of the seven, and abode with him. Philip is, is, is the only person in the Bible individually identified as an evangelist. You remember what Philip did? Acts chapter 8. He goes out, meets the, the eunuch, and spreads, he takes the, the, the message to an unconverted person. 
And that's what an evangelist does. The word evangelist, evangel, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the word good news, evangelical, evangelion, is the idea, that's where the word evangelist comes from. We use evangelical and so forth. It's all the same word. And an evangelist, come with me to 2 Timothy chapter 4. An evangelist is someone who focuses on sharing the gospel with lost people. By the way, what's the will of God? That all men be... So don't you need some people sharing the gospel with lost people so they get saved? Okay. First, Second Timothy chapter 4, verse number 5. Watch thou in all things, endure affliction, do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of thy ministry. Now... Being an evangelist is not limited to a special calling like Philip had. The Spirit took him out there. It's not that at all. You don't go to Acts 8 as, an, as, a, as a pattern for being an evangelist today. You know what you do? You go to 2 Timothy chapter 4 and you do the work of an evangelist. By the way, evangelism is far more caught than taught, Brother Woody used to say. I can still remember the first person I've had the privilege to sit down at a table and share the gospel with and see him trust Christ. I can still remember what the room, his, his wife had just fried bacon. <laughs> I still remember that. You know what it is? It's, it's more, you can teach all day long about evangelism until you do it. You don't really get into it. You talk any of these people around here right now who've participated in the, uh, the, 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 the festival and fair ministry that we've done all summer long. Talk to some of the folks that went to the booth and sat there and had people, hundreds and hundreds of people in a day, come and let them share the gospel with them. And you know what? You'll see an excitement in them that they didn't have prior to that. I'm not hearing any amens, but I, they're out there. <laughs> you guys are so, you know, like it's a sin to say anything. I miss Brother Benny. He was always amen. But doing it, and by the way, somebody said, I don't feel qualified. All you have to do is know more than the person you're talking to, and you're qualified. Do you know how to have eternal life? If they don't, you know more than them. Tell them what you know. You say, they might ask me a question I don't know the answer to. Then just say, I don't know the answer to that, but I got this one. And you do know that. So the issue of evangelism is the issue of sharing the gospel. Now, there was a time when God gave special capacities to special people to do that. Today, the Word of God equips you to share the gospel with everybody. Now, go back to Second Ephesians chapter 4. My point is the jobs need to be done. They're just not gifts. It's not that there's two or three people in here been given the gift of an evangelist and, whoo, well, you know, he's an evangelist, put evangelist in front of his name, go out and hold meetings. That's not it. That's a privilege that every member of the body of Christ has to do the work of sharing the gospel. It needs to be done. Every member's got that privilege. Then he says, some pastors and teachers. Now notice how after apostles, there's a semicolon. After he says, some prophets, semicolon. Some evangelists, semicolon. Then he says, some pastors and teachers. See, he doesn't put a some in front of teachers, and he doesn't put a semicolon in there anywhere. He groups together pastors and teachers. Now, they're, they're meant to be grouped together. But there's a false idea that goes around. It began to be really popularized by John MacArthur back in the 80s. That that should be pastor slash teacher or pastor hyphen teacher. And that the pastor teacher is what it is. It's one job, one office, pastor teacher, instead of pastor one, teacher another. And what they use is what's called the Granville Sharp Rule. Now, that's a bunch of Greek grammar. But the Granville Sharp Rule has four rules to it. Number one, if you have two nouns, pastor, teacher, connected by chi, which is that and, introduced by an article, that that single article is telling you that the pastor and the teacher are the same. Now, those three rules are fine. But the part of that... Granville Sharp rule that people forget is that it's two nouns that are singular. What are those nouns? They're plural. Granville himself 
Granville Sharp himself did not list this passage in the list of passages that he said fit the Granville Sharp rule. This is not saying that all pastors are teachers and all teachers are pastors. This rule is saying that there's some folks that are pastors and there's some people that are teachers. They are linked together, but they're not the same. Okay? And that's important to understand. When he talks about a pastor, time's up, I don't have time to do this, but a pastor is a shepherd. This is the only time that word occurs in your New Testament. It occurs back in the book of Jeremiah. And a pastor is a shepherd. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And the issue with a, the with a shepherd, and I know, you know, some people don't like the word pastor. We went through a thing a few years ago about you shouldn't call people pastors. You should only call them bishop because the office of a bishop and stuff. And we're not sheep, you know, Israel's sheep, and, and we're not shepherds because we're not sheep. Listen, I know that Israel is called sheep. But Gentiles are also called sheep in the Bible. Do you know that? you remember that? Matthew 25, he gathers before him the sheep and the goats. They're Gentiles. Puts the sheep on one side, the goats on the other. Those sheep were Gentiles that blessed Israel, but they were Gentiles. Okay? So you have to be, you know, you have to, you have to give, cut yourself just a little slack. The fellow that got all bent out of shape about that, we made a big thing about, we're not sheep. And somebody asked him one day, said, well, why do you call yourself a pastor? And see, he shot himself in the foot by saying something he shouldn't have said, making, making a big doctrine out of something he shouldn't have made a doctrine out of. Now, I'm just as quick as anybody to point out that sheep in the Bible are, are Israel and Israel's program. But all through apostles, did Israel have apostles? Did they have prophets? Did they have evangelists? Yeah, Philip was an evangelist. He's Israel's program. You see, these are interdispensational terms. These are not terms that only belong to one program. These are terms that are describing the issue of leadership. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse number 12. We beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. You see, the issue of being over you, the issue of oversight, come over, compare a verse over in Hebrews chapter 13. A pastor, a shepherd... An elder, a bishop, those are different terms that describe the same issue. It's the issue of leadership, watch care, protection. Hebrews chapter number 13, verse number 9, describing it in Israel's program. Um, verse 7 is what I wanted, not 9. Remember them which, are, which rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. There are people who, who have responsibility over, the watch care over the souls of people who are under their charge. A bishop is an overseer. So when he talks about pastors, he's talking about a, the leadership of the local church. Then when he talks about the teachers, that's somebody who instructs you. Now, while you have leadership in a local church, who are to be Bible teachers, by the way. You remember that? Jesus saw Israel scattered as a sheep without a shepherd. And they were faint, confused. And you know what he did? Go look it up, Mark 6. He taught them the Word of God. You see, what, a shepherd, what people need is to be taught God's Word, and the shepherd's responsibility is to teach God's Word to his people and bring them under the authority of the Scripture. The antidote for discouragement and, 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 and downcast saints is the Word. So the flock needs to be taught the Word of God. And that's the goal and the ministry. They're also teachers. That's everybody's... You remember the verse in Colossians 3 says, Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. What? Teaching and admonishing one another. All of us are designed to be teachers also. Your life is a member of the body of Christ. Listen, the sole care of people in the assembly doesn't lie just in the leaders. We're comforted by God in all of our tribulations. Why? That we might be able to comfort others who are in any tribulation with the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. 
You understand when you come here to church, it isn't just to come here to be taught. People say, well, I'm not getting anything out of it. Why don't you give something? You see, our ministry as members of the local church is also to be shared. Every believer is commissioned into the full-time ministry of teaching. Now, that's my point in all this. These jobs still need to be done. You still need to be able to identify God's Word and preserve God's Word through history. That's part of what we do. That's why we take a stand about those things. You need to share the gospel with unsaved people because the will of God is that all men be saved. But it's also that they come to the knowledge of the truth. That's why you have pastors and teachers. You have some leaders in the assembly who oversee the souls of people, the, 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 the watch care. But you also have every member. It isn't you hire a guy to do it for you. It's every one of us. I love that verse in Thessalonians. It says, know them that labor among you. We're all first working together and then have the responsibility of leadership over. So these jobs all still need to be done so that verse 12 can be accomplished. My wife yesterday watched the football game. A number of you watch different football games, I know. And uh, I was reminded as she was watching that football game of a description of football as 22 men on a field in desperate need of rest, being observed by 100,000 people in a stance desperately needing exercise. <laughs> well, you and I need to be on the field, not sitting in the stands, not sitting on the sidelines, you know, drinking pop and eating peanuts. We need to be in, in the, on the field doing the work of the ministry. Now, I'm going to talk to you about next time about how to figure out which one of these jobs and what job you ought to do. If God doesn't supernaturally implant them, how do you decide what you should do, where you should be? And this passage helps you with that. We'll talk about that next time. I just want you to understand something about these gifts. Number one, they're given after Israel's program. They're about us. They're not that. Don't go back there looking for them. These gifts aren't preaching that program. They're preaching this program. They're temporary. The giving was temporary, but three, the jobs still need to be done. And the job is accomplished through the, through the written Word of God in the believers working effectually in you that believed. Father, we thank you today for the privilege of being a part of the work of the ministry of the body of Christ. We thank you for that privilege in His name. Amen.